Okay. Sounds good. Excellent. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's session of the Connecticut Arts Standards Webinar. I'm Cindy Parson, hosting tonight's session. This is the first of six webinars that are planned over the next few weeks that are designed to help arts educators learn more about the new arts standards and how to implement them in the classrooms. Tonight we're excited to have Scott Schuler present our first session. You may remember Scott ser served as the arts consultant for the Connecticut State Department of Education until his retirement a couple of years ago, and he was co-chair of the National Music Standards Writing Team. Scott's presentation will introduce us to the newly adopted Connecticut Arts Standards and will help arts teachers from all, of, from all the arts disciplines begin to think about how to use them in their own practice. During Scott's presentation, participants will be able to use the chat box to submit questions, which we'll have Scott um, answer at the end of his presentation. You can find the chat box option in the lower right part of your screen. You may also submit comments and respond to other people's comments during the presentation. This session will be archived and available for viewing at your convenience. So Scott, welcome and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you, Cindy. It's good to be back in Connecticut, even if virtually here. Uh, would you like me to keep everybody muted or unmuted at this point in the um, background, the participants in the panel, in the uh, workshop? Participants should be muted. Um, yeah. Now I'm okay. not sure if, if you're aware that I do not see your screen at this point. You, I am not aware of that, and you okay. should be seeing my screen at this point, so that's not a good thing. Let's see what we can do to correct that. Share my screen. There we go. There we go. All right, great. All right, everybody. So let's launch in here because we have a limited amount of time today. And I'm going to move fairly quickly. So please do submit your questions using the chat box. Um, and if there's something urgent, uh, one of the other panelists will interrupt. Otherwise, I'll fly through these slides so we have some chance for discussion and uh, at the end, and then this is also being recorded for posterity here, so there'll be a chance to revisit any slides that you want to take a second look at. So the first question that we need to answer here is why, why a new set of standards? We had a set of existing standards. Uh, what's the reason that we came through, went through this process? Well, there's a whole lot that's changed since 1994 when the original standards were written. Some of you may be aware that I was on the team that wrote the first set of standards. Uh, many of these changes seem to demand a somewhat different way of packaging and uh, in some cases, especially in the area of technology, some different content in our standards. We then contacted the states and asked the State Departments of Education how they felt about it. Uh, surveyed their interest in standards. And I'm not going to show you all the slides from that survey, but I'll move on to this slide summarizing what they did want. It turned out that, that almost all of them wanted us to do new standards. Uh, and those taller bars indicate areas that they wanted to make sure we addressed in the new standards. You'll see that the biggest response was in measurable benchmarks and assessments. I'll come back to that when I talk about model cornerstones briefly. Uh, the idea of 21st century skills, and that it had to address at least the four traditional arts disciplines, dance, art, music, theater. They also wanted some other qualities, and as you, those of you who were pretty familiar with the previous standards and wondered why we did certain things, you'll see an explanation on this screen. They wanted us to start with pre-K because of the number of initiatives focused on pre-K around the country, wanting to make sure that children got the arts that they needed in that early childhood experience. They wanted a grade-by-grade grade set of standards, which has a big impact on the way that standards are written. If you were writing curriculum at the local level uh, for every cluster of grades, uh, then you would write them in a much broader stroke fashion than if you're writing grade-by-grade grade standards. And indeed, as we wrote these standards, we had to be more specific and detailed. 
we wanted levels at the high school, and I'll come back to that a little bit to explain what I mean there. We wanted to include some of those enduring things, big ideas, concepts that most contemporary curriculum teachers are demanding with the understanding people are going to all these to suit their own, own needs. Nevertheless, having assistant superintendent of school systems for on um, understanding by design years, I know that, that these are very high levels and suck up all outcome writing, kind of limited as that is. And uh, so we decided to provide a thoughtful set for perusal. Uh, they need to be accessible and some more uniform around the art across as I go along. As of this is the state of state adoption. Uh, you'll see we have a category set they are saying they adopted the national state against all uh, many states politically able to say anything that you've done is not anymore uh, said for my uh, so use them to inform their work or use some other euphemism uh, pretty much the way the common core was treated by a lot of states where it's called the Connecticut core instead of the common core um, I'm going to need to mute uh, somebody, or you could, if you could self-mute, I'm hearing noises like it's dinner time. Uh, you probably definitely want to take care of that. So what, are, what do these standards involve? Well, the traditional four disciplines for which we wrote standards in 1994 were where we started, but there was a lot of discussion about what to do about this fifth category, which uh, was something we debated substantially because as this visual indicates, there's a lot of a overlap in the use of technology with the fields themselves. In other words, we don't want visual arts to stop being a place where students use digital technology just because there's this another, there's another art form called media arts, uh, similarly music and theater and dance. So we debated it and there are some issues that arise from having media arts. First of all, media arts is inherently interdisciplinary. It's kind of the 21st century version of opera or musical theater in that it brings all the disciplines together. And if you look at the credits at the end of a movie, that's pretty obvious. Lots of people participate in doing this. And it's very hard to pin down briefly what media arts are. If you read the description up on the website, which I hope you will if you're in that field, you'll see that there, there have been several iterations of the description uh, and it's very broad. There is, however, no way of disputing that media are dominating our thinking and our teaching and learning more than ever before. And recognizing this, the Common Core, which Connecticut essentially adopted, uh, the English language arts section redefines reading as taking meaning from different media, one of which is the traditional written media that involves text, but it also includes the arts because the arts are inherently media delivery um, vehicles and they involve media. Uh, it's very disruptive, this idea of media arts, because it demands some changes in state policy. And I know you're not policymakers on the, on the line here, but these are very important questions that will affect all of us. Who's going to teach media arts? Uh, some states have decided that as long as you have arts credential of some kind, uh, whether it's visual arts or theater or music, whatever, that you'll be able to teach media arts. Other states have talked about doing a certification. Well, what's the implication of uh, districts needing to hire a separate teacher for media arts? Does this mean fewer teachers in the other arts? And if so, which art form takes the hit? My own guess, as I expressed when we were making this decision on the National uh, Coalition um, panel, uh, was that this visual arts is in the most danger. And that's sad because visual arts stands to benefit most from technology. So we need to make sure that we make decisions that support uh, visual arts and the other art forms as we're dealing with this. And uh, the question of how do we equip these programs comes up. Perkins money, which has traditionally gone exclusively to what we thought of as vocational or technical education, has not been available in most districts to the arts programs. So how do we equip the programs to provide that equipment? Now, these are all components that you'll find in your National Core Arts Standards when you go online. 
uh, we provided the philosophical foundation this time and in clearer terms and corresponding goals. I'll come back to that. I'll talk about the artistic processes, enduring understandings, the dealing with connections. Uh, there's a separate document that lists opportunity to learn guidelines, uh, which are the, the conditions that students need in order to be able to achieve these standards uh, in terms of instructional time, equipment, the kind of classroom space they should have. And then I have the dotted line here above model cornerstone assessments because in some cases they're not completed, but there are model cornerstone assessments posted up online uh, that are worth your attention. Now with all that to think about, it's very easy for people to be overwhelmed by these new standards. The truth is really what you need to understand as a starting point is the artistic processes and the performance standards. The performance standards are the grade by grade or level standards that say what kids should learn in fifth grade or at the high school level. And so if you've got that under control, the rest is just gravy. It's uh, extra stuff that you can use for your benefit. This is a visual that you won't find online anywhere, but it's a, a kind of a visual think piece to get a handle on the overall structure of the standards. And I'll walk you through some of this uh, as we go along today. When we talked about alignment among the five art forms, as it turned out, five art forms, we agreed that the overall umbrella was artistic literacy. Literacy, not in the sense of just reading notation, but being able to communicate and also understand the communications of others in the arts. And we developed a set of artistic founda philosophical foundations and lifelong goals. Those in this visual overarch here at the top of your figure. Now the arts are means to communication, creative personal realization, culture, history, and other connections, well-being and community engagement. I was originally going to talk more about this, but the amount of time we have limits this. Uh, let me simply say that the communication piece has always been a role of the arts, the idea of conveying meaning. I've alluded to that earlier. The idea of culture and history uh, being an important part of our work is, goes almost without saying, but we need to remind others of it. Uh, the creative personal realization is something that it's easy to lose track of, but the idea that we need to actualize ourselves as whole human beings and this ability to create is part of that. Well-being is probably the part of this that's um, most forward thinking, uh, or I should say most more, um, more of an evolutionary stage for us in that over the last oh, de few decades, overwhelming amount of research has come out showing that the arts actually contribute to our health, whether it's helping younger children uh, experience joy and develop their senses, or to help uh, seniors uh, maintain their mental capacity by engaging in arts activity. Uh, and in between, we have all kinds of examples that we all recognize from our own daily lives of how the arts enhance our well-being. This is spelled out in more detail in the a conceptual framework document I'll allude to later. And then fifth, in community engagement. And it's not just bringing people into the school or into a performing facility or an exhibit hall, although that's certainly part of it. It's also the idea of creating community, which we see over and over again in our arts classrooms, that the students begin to identify themselves as, as artists, as theater people, as dancers, uh, and, that this and that the other dancers become part of their personal uh, cadre of friends and colleagues. Uh, this is very important for students to be successful in school, to find ways of engaging and finding subsets of the population who are their peers. This is an example of what you might find in the conceptual framework that's available online. You'll see to the left a column that has the philosophical foundations listed, and to the right a column that lists the corresponding goals. So for every belief we have about the arts, which you find on the left, there is a corresponding statement about what it would look like if, if a citizen is artistically literate, if we're successful as arts teachers, what's going to happen out in the, uh, in the world? Uh, so let's take, for example, this creative personal realization. Well, it talks about how our participation in the arts in school helps us discover our own creative capacity and gives us a source of satisfaction. On the right, it says, then as a goal, we need to help each child, each 
person going through school find at least one arts discipline in which they develop enough competence so they could, if they chose, continue active involvement in doing the arts uh, and responding to the arts as an audience member as an adult. Not talking about them all becoming professionals, but making the arts part of their lives. And this continues on through the other, the fourth and fifth philosophical foundation, the same. On the website, the nationalartstandards.org that you see pictured in green up the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you can find the conceptual framework under the resources link. So if you click on resources, you'll be able to read it, download it, save it, print it, whatever you'd like to do. And it gives you a lot more detail than simply the philosophical background. Now, what else did we use to align the standards? So we agreed that we were going to use the artistic processes as an organizer. We had used those in the 1997 NAEP National Assessment in the Arts. A lot of states had adopted it. We used it. Anybody who went through the BEST program in Connecticut, may it rest in peace, uh, a really unique program nationally, learned about the artistic processes as they were being certified in art or music. Uh, these are the artistic processes circled over on the left-hand side. You'll notice that creating, responding, and connecting are in common among all the arts. And the only difference is what we jokingly refer to as the P verb. It's the performing or presenting or producing. Performing is the word we're using for the process in dance, music, and theater, presenting in visual arts, and producing in media arts. Creating a new work of art. Uh, is the creating process in a very brief way. Again, the conceptual framework explains it in more detail. Performing, presenting, or producing involves taking an existing work and giving it life through performance, perhaps, or through exhibit. And then responding is essentially the audience role. It's consuming the art forms. Now, I'm going to go into connecting in more detail later, so I'm going to put that off for now, but I just uh, put an asterisk here noting that you don't have to do separate standards in music for connecting. They're built into the other artistic processes. So those are the P verbs that I said vary a bit. So now here's a simple comparison between the 94 and 2014. I'm going to be building this matrix uh, block by block as we go. 90, 94 standards were focused on skills and knowledge, and there were content standards. Varied, the number varied from arts discipline to another. I think they went from six in visual arts to nine in music. Now we have, as central organizers, this umbrella of artistic literacy based on understanding the arts as well as doing them, and also this idea of the artistic processes, either three or four, depending on which art form you're in. This happens to be the performing process in music. It has five steps. These steps are called process components in the, national, the new national standards, and those are verbs that we Typically, the teachers in schools have always completed. We select literature for the kids, we analyze it, we interpret it, then we help them rehearse, and then we present it. The difference is, and this is a very important point for all the standards and all the disciplines, we want the kids to learn to do the verbs. That the kids, in order to be independent in their interactions with the arts as adults, need to be able to do this, these verbs. Otherwise, they can't really perform. They can just do what we tell them to in rehearsal. And I have saw a lot of that, not just in music classrooms, but in dance and theater classrooms as well. Uh, not the best classes, you understand, but it's just easy to slip into telling them what to do because it's faster than actually helping them understand why they're doing it. And uh, that's, a, that's a disease. So I gave you the answer to this already. If this were live, I'd ask you, but I'm just going to give you the answer. The steps in the artistic processes, in all the processes, in all the art forms, are called process components. And that's a term you should become comfortable with. Here are the process components in visual arts for presenting, which is the visual arts version of the P verb. You can see I've just extracted examples of standards at different grade levels to see a standard that goes with those process components. And this is an important point. All of the standards in all the art forms line up with a process component. So the question that you're answering, you'll see this in a slide later, when we were writing standards, we said, select, analyze, and interpret. Hmm, what should visual artists, visual arts students be able to do by the time they get to grade four or grade eight? 
Uh, in this case, I believe this is an eighth grade standard. And um, in this case, it says develop and apply criteria for evaluating a collection of artwork for presentation, building a collection to present to others. I wish I had more time to dwell there, but we don't. So here is just a quick comparison so you can look back and forth across between the two art forms to see how the process components for the P-verb vary. Now, I'm going to I'm skipped a couple of visual metaphors I normally use for the sake of time, but I will say in comparison to the 1994 standards where we gave teachers a large number of standards and it was there wasn't something holding them together really other than the the uh, overarching standards the top level standards there wasn't really a lot holding them together and i felt often like the teachers were coming to me with this it was like they had marbles in a box rolling around trying to figure out how to put it all together to make it coherent in their classroom if you teach to the processes if you go through the process components with your students this will give coherence to these new standards and they're designed specifically to enable you to do that in your classroom. I think you'll find it very useful from a pedagogic standpoint. Here, for example, is an example in music, taking that same performance, performing process components, and here's what they might look like in a classroom. Uh, do the kids start, go to, you know, go to the library and try to pick pieces for the entire ensemble, and we do that every concert? No, but you can present them to possible works to consider. Maybe this is going to be for a particular occasion, particular audience, maybe it's with, here are two possibilities to close our program and go through the process of educating the kids about these, help the kids discover uh, what there is to know about these works, and ultimately choose a couple of works, prepare them for performance with understanding. This could easily be played out in any of the performing arts. And in fact, if you think about it in visual arts, think about it in terms of an exhibit, it's the same kind of question that you'd want to answer. What, what do we want to say? What, what, what's our exhibit all about? What are we going to put on display and how are we going to structure it in a way, sequence it in a way that it has meaning for the audience? Here's an example of creating in two art forms, in visual arts and in music. Uh, and again, these are process components you see listed in the left and the right. These are actually very familiar to other um, educators. If they understand process writing, for example, this is very much process writing. And scientists should also recognize this. This is the process that Edison used to invent the light bulb uh, process of, that began with imagining. What am I trying to do? What are some possibilities? Experimenting, exploring, and finally uh, making. Now responding is something that we often think of as a passive activity, but it really isn't. It has, there are steps to the responding process as well when we're playing in the audience role. And I, as I say often when I work with music people, uh, it begins with selecting. You know, there are times when it just happens to us. You know, we walk in, we get on a bus and somebody's playing music or we're walking into the gap and we hear certain music. And it happens to us all the time visually. We walk down the street and we're presented with visual imagery that we didn't necessarily select. But when we have an arts experience, it often begins with choosing which exhibit to go to, what button to push on our radio, what to download, what channel to choose on our television set. Uh, and then we go through a process, a thoughtful process, hopefully, about that experience that ultimately ends in our evaluating that experience. And that's a very important process to help kids go through because the last step where they evaluate determines whether they want to do it again. And we want them to have such an understanding of the experience that when they do their evaluation, they say, yes, I would like to go to another exhibit. I would like to hear another live performance. I would like to experience uh, this kind of theater again. So marching the kids off to, uh, let's say, a dramatic production without giving them proper preparation is doing them a disservice because if they decide it's negative, if the best thing that happened in that experience is lunch, uh, we're in trouble. So I gave you the bare essentials. I said the artistic processes were, the, were one thing you should understand, but I've fleshed that out now, giving you some detail about the artistic processes, what the different names for those. We've talked about the process components. I'm going to talk about the anchor standards soon. And the process components then give us a basis for the performance standards, that every performance standard is played out across the grades 
lined up with a process component. So it's what are we going to do with evaluating at grade four, evaluating at grade five, evaluating at grade six, for example. There's also a glossary, and there are people who've asked me many questions about the standards that would have been answered had they referred to the glossary. Uh, we developed a thoughtful glossary to go with our standards for a reason, because in our art forms, even within one art form, we tend to use the same term differently, depending on who trained us. And frequently we have other words for the same thing. When you think across art forms, it's even more true. It's like the Tower of Babel, we, you know, the term line means so much. It's so different in visual arts versus music versus theater that it's important to refer to this glossary. You should think of the glossary as part of the performance standards. And I mentioned up at top visual arts, there was a big emphasis on enduring understandings as their um, standards were generated. So you should definitely pay attention to the EUs, the enduring understandings as you're looking at the visual arts standards. Now we talked about having the same process components in the different art forms and there was a time in our development process where that was true and it broke apart, probably just as well, but I'm not, I, there were times when we didn't think so. Now I'm just showing you here at one point in our development process where we were as of November. Now these were all released in June, so you'd see it's like six or seven months before the release date. We were such different places. What you see in each of these columns are the verbs that each art form had picked for their process components. So in the creating process, it ranged from two, envision, conceptualize, and develop in theater, under, in that column, to visual arts. It had a whole bunch of words. They were having trouble narrowing down there. And then if you look down at the bottom, I'll come back to this, but the, in the connecting, Visual arts and music agreed that we really felt that con that connecting is embedded into everything we do and we didn't need a separate set of standards for that. So at that point, we were all over the ballpark. Ultimately, we decided what we were going to do is continue our development and then get together and come up with some common anchor standards that would be useful to us in, in sort of summarizing what we'd done across the art forms. They're particularly useful when presenting these standards to audiences like school boards, state boards. They did not generate the performance standards. And I can tell you for sure they didn't generate them in music where we relied mostly on the anchors, on the, um, on the process components to generate our standards. And they didn't do it in visual arts because visual arts was working off the enduring understandings. These are after the fact uh, these were developed after the fact as an explanatory tool. So while you can say that where they're aligned, we're aligned across art forms using the common anchor standards, in reality, we don't want to treat them like we treated the content standards in 1994. They're not anywhere near the same level of importance. And when I talk with music people about developing curriculum, I say basically ignore the anchor standards, go to the process components. Again, another way of saying the same thing, that the common anchor standards that negotiated illustrate parallels didn't generate the content that kids are going to be learning. They explain it. So let's talk briefly about the understanding piece. I mentioned that one of the developments in the new standards was that we provided enduring understandings and essential questions. We did this as a service to schools that are using these. And in visual arts in particular, the enduring understandings generate we need to pay attention to those. Uh, they're very useful. And I'm going to be doing a session in the June event in Connecticut talking about essential questions and understandings. There's to be said and done. But the essential questions sometimes are a really good entry point to this notion of the new standards. So when you're presenting and your colleagues, as it were, Here's an example of, of some anchor standards. In the, uh, the, um, you see the three process components on the left, and on the right you see enduring understandings that go with those. Again, there's, there's, there's a, an enduring understanding for each process component, sometimes two uh, for each process component, and there are corresponding essential questions that go with those. Again, 
you ever get bogged down with all this, just go back to artistic processes and the process components, performance standards. But this extra content can be very useful. And when you read them, I think you'll find that you agree that students should be able to do these things, but we don't always teach them to understand these things in school, and we should be. So here are our bare essentials again. Take a deep breath. Now, we had our own essential questions, if you will, if we're writing. The question we were asking as we wrote each performance standard was, what evidence of artistic literacy or competence in one of the process components should be expected of students at this grade level? Grade four, how well should they be involved, able to select literature for their own performance, for example? Now, let's go to organization. Again, I'm sorry that this is moving forward quickly, but we have limited time. Well, similarly to 1994, we had a vision that said that if the students could experience all of the art forms through grade eight to some extent, sorry, I should take the microphone away from my mouth before I drink water, uh, then based on that, they should discover something that really resonates with them, one of the art forms, and study that in greater depth at the high school level. You've noticed in Connecticut, through the efforts of many advocates over many years, finally we're on the verge of a real high school graduation requirement in the arts. Hopefully the students who are electing the arts classes to fulfill that are doing so based on having experienced sequential instruction in those fields uh, in their K-8 experience. Uh, this particular meta visual metaphor treats each art form as a different color and without labeling them simply says they pick one and they try to continue that in high school. That would be the one presumably that they would then become competent enough in to continue their involvement as adults. So I mentioned earlier that in grades pre-K to eight, there are grade by grade standards that have been developed. So pre-K, K, one, two, et cetera. Here's an example of one process component, in this case, evaluate and refine under creating and music, evaluate and refine process component played out across the grade levels. And you'll notice that there's only one standard. This is one of the things people say, oh, there's so much stuff in these new standards. I can vouch for music in particular. There are far fewer standards at any grade level than there were back in 1994 uh, in those standards. Uh, the reason it seems like there's more stuff is because we have separate standards for each grade level. And of course, we have the enduring understandings and all that other stuff. But here you can see, with very few exceptions, we have one standard per grade level corresponding to evaluate and refine. It splits at grade six through eight because we felt like we couldn't combine them all into one big long standard. They were separate ideas. Um, now, the red text here is when you're on the, the um, nationalartstandards.org site, anytime you see red text, it tells you that this, this is a place, that's in, this is something that's in the glossary. So you can refer to the glossary to flesh out what that means exactly. In fact, I strongly urge you to do that in case your own personal interpretation differs from the intent of the standards. In the music standards, you see italics at times and what we did was we used italics, this is only in music, to indicate new content. So it helps you see what changes from one grade level to another. For example, going from um, grade one to grade two here, you see that revised personal music uh, is the new concept at grade two. So in the 94 standards, the top level we call content standards, the top level uh, is anchor standards and the new standards. The bottom level in 1994, we called achievement standards. And in the new standards, they're called performance standards. Again, I'm not recommending the anchor standards become a big part of your concern, but they're explanatory. Now at the high school, we took a different approach and we had to because the arts are not required in grades nine through 12, in most schools at least. And therefore we needed to come up with a way that we could write standards that didn't say this is an 11th grade visual arts standard. The way we did that was to create three levels, which we called proficient, accomplished, and advanced. The proficient level 
corresponds essentially to one year of study at high school. So if we were doing a high school graduation requirement uh, and we were building curriculum for ninth grade visual arts, let's say, uh, if they come in at ninth grade and join us, or even if they came in at 12th grade and took their one credit, uh, they would be expected presumably to finish the proficient level by the end of that year. The accomplished level is equivalent to four years of sequential study, three or four years is what it says in the document. I, thought, I always thought of it as the kind of graduation. If you stick with me for four years, here's what I, where I want you to be at the end of the four years. And the advanced level, which is achieved by a number of our students in high school, is a way of us demonstrating that many of our kids end up doing real college level work at the high school level. You don't have to be in an AP class to be doing transcendent work. Uh, it's pretty obvious in music, you make all state sometimes, or you compose some great piece of music. Um, in art, maybe you win the Scholastic Art Awards, but really we have a number of students who don't win one of those awards who are nevertheless operating at the college level. And since we're under pressure in schools to have our kids do college level work, uh, this advanced level really spells out what that looks like. Here's another way of thinking about them, uh, another way of visualizing it. Uh, there's an asterisk there saying that there is an exception in, uh, in music again to how we did things, and I'll explain that in a minute. In music, because our curriculum is pretty differentiated, there are the traditional band, orchestra, choir ensembles, a number of ensembles that have become increasingly popular, uh, which may or may not begin in, back in elementary school or middle school. Uh, then we have at the high school level composition classes, music theory classes, guitar, keyboard, which is the instrument that the largest number of people as adults continue to play. So to reflect that, when we wrote the new standards, we chose to um, create strands of standards. This is unique to music, and you should understand that. There's a general music strand that goes pre-K to eight, and then there are four strands, which you see circled here in uh, gold color, the ensemble, the guitar keyboard, the composition theory, and music technology, which have their own sets of standards. And in some cases, they start at the proficient level and go through advanced. That would be true of composition theory and music technology. In other cases, they are actually are novice and intermediate levels that precede proficient because you don't just walk into an ensemble, typically as a ninth grader or as a high school student, and um, we, we don't expect them to suddenly start doing proficient level work. The foundation's typically begun earlier, and increasingly that's true in guitar and keyboard as well. We see baritone ukulele courses, um, Suzuki guitar courses, um, starting the kids quite early, or keyboard in some cases. So I've just explained why we have this novice intermediate level for two strands. So just check for understanding. You should be able to answer this question at this point. For which grades do we have grade by grade standards? The answer here is pre-K to eight. And then for which grades do we have leveled standards? And the answer here is high school. With the, and in addition in music, we have levels uh, in a couple of strands. So, I've mentioned the, this is another check for memory here. Why is some of the text in the performance standards in red? Uh, if you think about it, you should be able to answer that those are the words that are in the vocabulary. And in music, why the italics? The answer is because that's new content. And where can you find the complete glossary for your art form that goes with these standards? Again, down at the bottom of the page here in glossary or on the NAFME website. And I'll show you that a little bit later for the music standards. So let's talk about connecting briefly. I've alluded to some of the issues already. Uh, these are some of the issues that came up as we discussed whether to, uh, to have a separate stand uh, process called connecting. I have to confess I was among those who argued that there's no one process that causes, that leads to connections. It's multiple processes. Um, but the end result was that uh, essentially visual art and music were outvoted by the three smaller art forms, art, dance, and theater or excuse me, media arts, uh, dance, and theater. And as a result, most of the art forms, and so again, visual arts and music at, that, at the point of November was not, we were not dealing with a separate category at all. 
So what visual arts decided to do was they moved some of the content out of creating and put it into connecting. And in music, what we did is we just repeated standards from the other disciplines that reflected what we felt were connecting standards. So if you go, if you're a music teacher, you really only have to worry about creating, performing, and responding. Everything else is a repeat. Anything that you'd find under connecting is a repeat of something that's already embedded in the others. Uh, the reasoning being, as, as we debated this out, that there's no way that I would teach a piece of uh, jazz literature without the students having any contextual understanding of jazz. Very similarly to how we would never teach cabaret, the, the musical in theater class, without the kids understanding something about the emergence of Nazism and some of the contextual uh, metaphors that are in that uh, play. Uh, in all of the other art forms, though, you do need to pay attention to connecting because it contains unique, important content. Now, when we were writing these standards, we were very aware of the danger of writing them in a vacuum somewhere in a people in a room isolated from everyone else, which, by the way, is the way the Common Core was largely written. Uh, a group of people who were pretty smart, but written in isolation. Um, so we were very anxious to avoid that problem. And the way that we did that was to take our original standards, these are the 94 standards, many of you would recognize, look at international benchmarks, things that have been done in other countries, work that's been other done, done in other countries, frameworks that might inform us, the UK, um, Australia, um, Singapore, a lot of other countries informed our work. Research, and we worked with very closely with the College Board on this. Uh, they really deserve kudos for the support they provided to this process, as well as our own, where we had them, research teams within each discipline. And then here's the key. Getting to the student work is always critical in, in really getting at what's real in the classroom. Can the kids do this? Are there kids doing this right now given good instruction? So that leads us to the question, why MCAs? Uh, sorry, a little reference to the village people here. Why do, we, why do we have model cornerstone assessments? Well, again, reminding you that we were asked to deal with measurability and assessment as we did our standards by the State Departments of Education. We nevertheless knew that this was important anyway. And in fact, in the understanding by design approach, they use something called cornerstone tasks which have these qualities that you see exhibited on the screen, they really act as anchor points. And given enough time, and I, I do entire workshops just around this, this issue. In fact, I'm doing a summer course at Gordon College about this. Um, the, a great way to, to get a curriculum team together, we saw this over and over again in our development in Connecticut, in particular, has been a leader in this. When I was at the State Department of Ed, we had these great people at the district level who were doing this kind of work in Middletown, Simsbury, Farmington, um, boy, just, I, I'm gonna forget somebody, East Hartford did fabulous work on this, uh, and so on. Developing performance tasks, essentially units of study that were taught by all the teachers in the district, not to make the, dis the curriculum rigid, but to anchor that curriculum so that their kids, we ensured there was non-negotiable content that all the kids did across the district. Very important, uh, both for your curriculum and for the kids. And it also generates student work that you can use to see what's actually happening. You can't fake student work. You can, tell, you can have lots of conversations in faculty meetings, but the student work speaks for itself. What are we actually accomplishing? And is that what we intended to accomplish? And if not, what do we do about that? So the model cornerstone assessments really answer some key questions. How do we integrate the artistic processes into a sequence? Well, a well-written unit, which is what many of these MCAs are, will do that. Secondly, how well do the model cornerstones, the assessment components in these model cornerstones reflect student success on a, in carrying out an artistic process? And what are the traits and the, the scoring scales that we can use to measure success on these standards. Now, traits in general refers to a category of, 
of the student's work. So for example, in music, we often taught about, talk about pitch, rhythm, tone quality. In art, you might talk about craftsmanship, you might talk about, uh, you might talk about creativity, but you may have something even more specific. You might say their, uh, their ability to create three-dimensionality. How did they do in terms of on a two-dimensional surface, creating a sense of three dimensions? Uh, and then we develop scales. Sometimes they're rubrics, sometimes they're checklists that, that enable us to measure how well did the kids do within this trait? How well are they creating three-dimensionality? Then we have this illustrative work, which should become part of our curriculum. We should collect work from our district or, or borrow work from other districts which you now can do by going online on the model cornerstone assessment to the model corner assessments on the national site and use this work and say, all right, is our work, is this our expectation here in Bristol or, or um, Brantford? And if so, how well are we doing? Are we meeting that standard? Let's score some of our work using the same uh, tr scale, scoring scales and see how we're doing in relation to this benchmark. And in fact, benchmarks are something that we can do once we have collected student work and saying, here's our level of expectation for East Hartford. This is what we expect students to achieve. How well are they doing that? I bring you back to this visual again to say, we did model cornerstone assessments for these grade clusters, grades two, five, and eight, and also for at least three levels at the high school level proficient, accomplished, and advanced levels at the high school level. So in your art form, you should find examples of these. Now their level of sophistication will vary somewhat from art form to art form. Uh, certainly we have more teachers in art and in music nationally than we have in the other art forms. Um, I would say that you're, you're going to find that the theater high school uh, model cornerstones might be a little more satisfactory for your use than the elementary, uh, primarily because there are fewer elementary theater teachers to draw on as a pool in developing those uh, resources. But in all cases, and especially in media arts, which I'm going to come back to that, is really a field that we're still getting our hands around, <laughs> virtual hands at least. Um, the media arts, the model cornerstones really serve a different purpose than is to illustrate the kind of work that we consider media arts to be and what kids are capable of doing in media arts. So that'll be another interesting exploration for you to go to the site and listen to and watch that work. Now who did the work? I give you this uh, not because I think we need to give credits, but more because the conversation frequently when you talk about national standards these days especially with this big backlash against anything national, um, is to say, oh, is it like that Common Core stuff that we've heard so much about? And the Common Core was a public relations disaster. Um, I don't have time to go into it in great depth today, but simply to say that the Common Core probably has become a lightning rod for people's frustration in general for so-called school reform with a capital S, capital R. And so it's taken a lot of hits in the press, and it had a lot to do with the fact that it was developed, as I alluded to earlier, by a small numbers of people in isolation from the field without gaining enough input from the field. Very few people know somebody who actually helped write the Common Core. That's not true in the arts. We, we bent over backward. We actually had a presentation from the people who worked on the Common Core, and as we were listening, we were all going, boy, we're not doing it that way. We're getting our field engaged in this. So who was involved? And we had to answer some questions about this. You know, do you get, uh, and I put this in quotation marks, so-called smart people, you know, the people with the PhDs together to, who have a theoretical framework? Uh, do you work with program leaders who, sing, who are often involved in curriculum work? Or do you rely on practicing teachers, recognizing that some teachers are a lot better than others at doing curriculum kind of work, which is what standards really are? And how many people can you engage without screwing up the process? That's my reference to Camel at the bottom of the page. You know, how can you, how can you get people engaged really, not artificially, uh, and just tell them that we want input and then ignore their input? How do we really get them engaged uh, on a national scale? Now, this is a, these are excerpts from an article that appeared, you'll notice, way back in 2009, before the Common Core was released, as they were developing it, 
you can see that most of the work was being done, I've highlighted in red here, second to the last paragraph, by a group called Achieve, which most of you probably never even heard of before. It's a policy organization. And then the College Board and ACT were mostly uh, noted for developing college admissions tests. And the National Governors Association, the NGA, you see in the last paragraph referred to here, was trying to keep their work working meetings close to the public because they felt that would protect the integrity of the process. Now, these are many of them the same governors who've been running the other way, running away from Common Core because it became controversial. Uh, notably, Scott Walker in Wisconsin, and Governor Perry in Texas are among these. So the governors were really behind this initiative. And then when it got, the seat got a little hot, they started running. Well, the truth is that there's good content in those standards. Connecticut adopted them and for good reason. But the process itself was so flawed that it's led to what will probably kill the Common Core and many has already killed the Common Core in many states. So we didn't want to do that. So we tried to pull together a plausible coalition of organizations that knew something about content and curriculum in the arts and then went to work together to try to engage our, our teams. So there were more than 100 people on the writing teams from around the country. And this, by the way, doesn't even include the media arts teams right now. Uh, you can see that they were spread out, pretty much they're clustered according to the population density in our country. Uh, many people from many states were involved. We were very deliberate about picking people from different geographic areas uh, and people who were different in other ways as well. Uh, these are the people who were the writing team chairs. You'll notice that in music, uh, I and Richard Wells, who um, was in Simsbury and Torrington and uh, at least one other district over the course of his career, co-chaired the music writing. Uh, but you'll have people from everywhere from uh, Maryland to Michigan to California leading these teams. A good group of chairs. This happens is a photograph of the chairs. On the left, you'll recognize Jay McTie, one of the co-authors of Understanding by Design, who was very engaged in this, uh, and uh, his wife, Daisy, who was a visual arts supervisor in Baltimore County, Maryland for a number of years. We also involved arts educators at the field level by public, by, we put out a public call before we selected our writing team members. We asked them to submit materials so we could vet them and pick people who had some background, had done some good work in, in curriculum and assessment. We did uh, confidential reviews with, with people who had volunteered but promised confidentiality to give us initial feedback before we made public releases. We did public releases on multiple occasions. We also did focus groups. And we've involved people from all over the country and some from international schools, actually, in the model cornerstone assessment piloting. Uh, we made sure that we had a good distribution across the urban, suburban, and rural districts for uh, people who were reviewers. Uh, we had literally, you see, 250,000 certified teachers. We had 21,000 arts educators, arts advocates, teaching artists, and others who reviewed the drafts and gave us input. And believe me, as I was reading it, I believe that figure. You see down near the lower right-hand corner, a million fifty-six thousand responses and comments. I read a good percentage of those, all the ones that were related to music. So we paid attention to it, and we had big long meetings on Sunday nights to all hours, much to the, uh, the chagrin of our spouses, uh, working on the feedback that we'd gotten from the field. We had focus groups in every state. You'll notice that in Connecticut, Connecticut was one of the states that had a focus group. These are groups of people brought specifically together to look at the standards and give feedback before we release them. And you'll notice in terms of our reviews that Connecticut in spite of being a relatively small state compared to these other states, gave far, was far more engaged in giving feedback and reviews than, uh, than other states, including some that are much larger in population than ours. So we had a lot of involvement. So where do you find the standards? Well, I recommend music people go first to the nafme.org slash standards um, page, because the way we've organized the standards in my experience, the way we've organized the standards as they're, as they're posted on that page, uh, they are probably maximally useful to you for curriculum development purposes. Um, for music, but definitely for the other art forms, you can go to the National Core Art Standards, nationalartstandards.org site, 
and it gives you a number of options that you can use to manipulate the standards, uh, download them, create your own customized handbook. You can see in the lower right hand corner to um, just focus on grade levels or strands that you're particularly interested in. Now, I've already alluded to why we were different than the Common Course. I'm not going to dwell here as much. I do presentations about that sometimes. But I'm now able to take your questions. And remarkably, we've done that, according to my screen, in 50, less than 55 minutes. So I know I was flying. I apologize for that. And now we can start dealing with some of the uh, your input. Now, how are we going to? How am I going to get any questions that I need to answer, uh, Cindy or others? Scott, um, I would read them to you. I don't have anybody that has actually asked any yet. I've had okay. a discussion, but um, I'm amazed that you got through this in in uh, 55 minutes. <laughs> It's, uh, they tell me when I present down south that I'm, I must be from the northeast because I talk fast. Yeah, they don't like us from up here when you go down there. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, well, we wouldn't go there. So, Any questions? Anybody please uh, submit um, to the chat box and I'll forward them to Scott. Great information, Scott. Um, you know, as much as I, I have had some... Um, um, work done. I've, I've done some work with the, with these standards already, but you know it's always great to see um, where they came from and 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 how meaningful they can be in our in our classrooms. I, your your interpretation and, and uh, your presentation is really helpful, even to me. Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe one of the questions we can ask our audience is, uh, what art forms do we have represented? Do we know that tonight? I don't have the list of who the participants are, so I don't have that information. Well, let's see here. If you're out, if you um, can can tell us. Let me. Uh, that are watching, just type in what, what visual, what arts form uh, you are representing, or music, art, uh, theater, etc. And share with all. Okay, I got one, two, so far, just visual art so far. Okay, so then let's talk a little bit more about the visual arts. And Cindy, you can certainly uh, lend depth to this because you've been working with it. Uh, but I've alluded to already the fact that the enduring understandings played a big role in this. And maybe what I can do is unmute because we don't have that many people still on the line. Right, yeah. So what I can do is take the, um, the people we do have on the line and unmute them. And then, if appropriate, we can have a little bit of a discussion. Scott, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Cindy Renshaw. I just wanted to tell you that you're awesome. <laughs> Boy, I'm sure glad I unmuted. <laughs> Amazing. Um, really. Um, I want to tell you how helpful uh, your lecture was. I came to a three day event at Fairfield U a couple of years ago, and it was fantastic. And I just want to say on a very practical level, I'm struggling with the formative assessment. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's something we can talk about now, but I'm coming to your live event in June. <clears throat> well, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. Formative, there are people who want to place rules and uh, people publish books. And when you, every time you publish a book, I've been there, done that, you want to put things in boxes where you've got column A and column B. And here's the column that's formative and here's the com column that's summative. And we want to make sure that they're distinct and we never cross over. And the reality is that we cross over. We don't have, we have uh, some noise coming in from Lindsay's class. So I'm going to, I'm going to mute Lindsay temporarily here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sounds like a party. It does sound like a party. And as a former music teacher, it sounds very familiar. The, um, the truth is that we don't have the luxury in our, at least in our K-8 programs, of doing this whole set of assessments we call formative and not using them for when we have to make summative judgments like grading. What we have to be is very efficient and we have to collect information all the time, which becomes part of what we use 
um, mostly, I mean, the main purpose is to help kids be more successful and figure out how well we're doing in terms of delivering uh, the curriculum. But the same content also then figures in when we are assigning grades later on or doing some kind of formative judgment making about their work uh, because we, don't, we just don't have time to do both. At the high school level, more so, more opportunity. Well, I, I love the, um, one of the things we did at your previous event was we made um, units and we made unit activities and things. But now that, now that I'm actually applying this in the classroom, <clears throat> Um, I just feel like <clears throat> what I would like to contribute is some mm -hmm. examples. So, okay, <clears throat> I want a choice-based classroom. I'm a, I'm a process teacher. I want a, a menu. I want children to be on independent projects. I want to give them a general theme and a media and a mission. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> So I have to have these really, really general things. And my, my administrators aren't happy about that. They want, you know, it's, it's just difficult. I'm, I'm using like two standards all the time, I'm using the same two yep. standards, yep. and this is, uh, frustrates me. Well, this is uh, this is another case where people go to seminars, or, uh, and I mean it's not their fault. It's it's that some people think in one in certain people think in different ways, and art teachers tend to think differently than music teachers on average. You know, in the way they approach their content, it's 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 inherent. There's a reason they chose visual arts. Um, you and in, but in almost every arts classroom, you're addressing multiple standards at the same time. So you can't, for example, adhere to this where the uh, principal or whoever's supervising you says, write the standard you're working on today up on the board, and it's going to be just, it can only be one standard, and then you're going to tell me how well the kids did on that standard. Well, we're always having to layer because we only see the kids maybe once or twice a week. Um, at the K-8 levels at least. So we're always teaching multiple standards and we're taking, we're making gradual progress. It's evolutionary, not like today we nailed that one. Uh, that hardly ever happens. So it's partially an educative process. Uh, the way that a lot of systems are, are set up and including the tests that have driven on schools over the last couple of decades, the, like mastery tests, are convergent. And what you're teaching for is divergence, uh, creativity uh, of thought. It doesn't mean that you don't have, that's a double negative, sorry. It doesn't mean that you don't have criteria that are quality criteria you apply regardless of the choices they make, but you, you do allow variation in the product and it's not all everybody solving the same math problem. It, a lot of it depends on the administrator and how much they know art. I've had two two different um, administrators now, both math teachers. I'm about to just bash my head against the wall. Um, mm -hmm. and, and can I tell you that, I'm sorry, as an administrator myself, you, as an art trained administrator, I go in with a different eye than your math evaluator is going to come in with. So it's a, as Scott said, it's it's a matter of educating them in what to, what does a good lesson look like? What does good instruction in an art environment look like? And um, that's a task that, you know, we're trying to, as part of our standards rollout, we're trying to, to, to develop um, seminars specific to non-arts evaluators. Hmm. So Wonderful. hopefully we can get them to, to come to these seminars and, and get more information. You know, what does it look like? What, what should they look for? And this is also a, an application, uh, Cindy and Cindy, um, <laughs> of the model cornerstone assessments. Because if they understand the work and they understand why the work is scored as it is, that'll give them a different context for going back into the classroom because they've seen what kind of work kids should be doing. I don't know if any any other um, arts uh, teachers have been expressing this, but I'm getting tremendous pressure for literacy in my classroom. And my evaluator, every single time he comes in, he'll say, I didn't hear you using a vocabulary word. And I'm like, well, that's because my kids are painting. They're deep in the zone. They're in exactly where I want them, deep in their own imagination. And they don't want to be yanked to the left brain. <clears throat> so so somebody else here complaining, um, uh, but I'm, I'm being pressured to put literacy in every lesson. Well, first of all, 
go, let's go back to something. I realized I flew over this point, but let me come back to this point because it's an important one. In the Common Core, there are, you know, people are criticizing Common Core. I would say that the English language arts Common Core might legitimately be criticized to some extent for um, big jumps in expectation and pushing young children to do stuff maybe earlier than they're ready for. However, in the aggregate, the, the ELA Common Core is very art supportive because any time that it makes reference to literacy, essentially if you go into the reading section of the Common Core, they first of all have all kinds of mentions of visual arts and the other art forms in the, in the standards themselves. And sec secondly, the, the definition of what it means to read literacy, the arts are the text. The arts are text, so when the kids are painting, they're doing yeah. the equivalent of writing in, in English text. Visual text, Brian brought that out at the last event at Fairfield. He was brilliant, talking about, you know, the, the, he was correlating visual literacy to, you know, um, writing. Uh, but my, um, I, I completely understand that, and I, obviously really endorse that, but I'm just saying <clears throat> I'm probably not the only teacher being oh, no. pressured. Oh, no, no, you're not. No, and then the other piece of it is because if you're teaching the standards and you're having the kids reflect and critique, then although they might not be doing it today, and this is the point you were making, you know, they want to see how much did they actually talk today, when they go through that reflection, they are, chances are, doing the kinds of thoughtful work uh, and here you have to have them write in English text um, that's going to very be very impressive and probably superior to what the kids are doing in a lot of other classes because it's their own work they're talking about. Well, I like the new standards. Um, I, I've been I've been fine using them. I just I'm having trouble with the presentation because my kids fight it. <clears throat> uh, but I like that they're there. I like the way mm -hmm. I like the way going. I'm I'm trying. I've been trying to, I've been doing some theater games with my kids, just trying to get them comfortable in front of other people. Very cool. Um it's just a tough you know, it's tough my yep. kids. But um so I'm on board. It's just I just I don't know if anyone I, I should bring this up at the next department meeting. Just it's difficult to play around and find your own speed when it when you just feel like you're being scrutinized, you know. So, and the other piece of it is, and you know this because you work with Brian Frazier, but I'm saying this because it's on the webinar and somebody else will hear it, uh, that that tier three vocabulary, the art specific vocabulary that you're helping your kids learn, that needs to be built into the curriculum. This is in all the art forms. That, that We need to agree on vocabulary. Uh, visual arts in particular, just because we're creative people in visual arts, we like to have individuality, there's a resistance sometimes to using the same terminology uh, among different teachers, even in the same in the same department, and they need to agree, and then they need to use that vocabulary and have the kids use the vocabulary and decide at what grade levels are they going to be accountable for which vocabulary, so that that can build over time, and then when you when the principal or whoever it is is saying where's that where's that vocabulary you can say, okay, look at their reflections the last time. And they aren't even going to know what a lot of those words mean if they're a typical math teacher. Um, uh, we wish they did, but they don't. So you're making your case all the time. It's a, it's, it's a brilliant, I mean, it's a brilliant start. The standards make sense. I love the site. I love all the units. I really enjoy the process of making a unit with a group. I wish I had more of that in my department. Um, mm -hmm. I'm pretty much like all alone again, mm -hmm. but um, it's wonderful. I'm excited about June. Thank you for doing this. And there's there's a lot of resources supporting me. Um, I guess we're just going to have to take it one day at a time. <clears throat> well, you thank you so much, then Cynthia, for putting this it's stuff out time. there. Because these are exactly the kinds of issues that other people and and frankly, it's not just visual arts. It's in music. They, you know, they they play a few pieces and have a rehearsal, and then they they say, when did the kids write today? Uh, right. You know. and, and, they, and they don't realize that the Common Core identifies uh, literacy in our art forms through um, different formats. Uh, literacy in, in our, in visual art can be, you know, looking at art and talking about art. It doesn't have to be reading or writing about it. 
there, well, there's a whole other aspect that's beyond really um, my job, and that is more of the art therapy part of kids um, my in my neighborhood are, you know, economically impoverished, socially mm -hmm. impoverished, emotionally impoverished. And part of what I want to do is <clears throat> create an environment that's not necessarily part of the academics where they just feel safe enough to find themselves and express themselves. And right. that, sort of, that has to be a protected private space. And sometimes I just want them to have that time. They're working, they're being creative, and it's not necessarily academic. It's part of them actually being creative and trying to find you know, explore their inner worlds without right. being goal directed as long as they're in the zone. And so when people, they're in, they're quiet, they're and they're working, they are actually reflecting on every decision they're making. They may not be aware of that, but every time they go to pick a new color of paint or where to put the next line, or they're they're making a decision based on what they're doing. So they're, they're really reflecting on the fly when they're doing something like that. And there's well, a reason to be hopeful, uh, I believe, in the, the trends that are promising in education have to do with uh, performance assessments where the kids are producing richer projects than just filling in bubbles, uh, where there's performance-based learning or project-based learning is another national uh, project. And even if you look at the the high school graduation requirements, uh, the ones that were enacted and then never really implemented, and the new ones that are in the legislature right now, they still call for a senior demonstration project of some kind, which will require kids to do the work more, much more like what you're doing in art class than what traditionally kids have done in math class. Uh, not that they might not, that they wouldn't use math or, or language in that. Most of the time there's some requirement that they do. But what you're getting those kids to do by being reflective and focused on producing product is something that relates not only to their work life after they graduate, but also to some trends in education that are going to hopefully change the paradigm a little bit for everybody. Well, it's, it's wonderful to have this <clears throat> scaffolding to plug things into. It helps me try to articulate what I do. But somebody asked me, well, how do you know if they're really what I call the zone? And I say, I say to a teacher, a classroom teacher, you know when your kids need a break, don't you? You can feel it. You can feel when your kids have just, they're not going to focus and they need a break. Mm -hmm. And you can tell when they're deeply concentrating. You get the feeling. You can just feel it. You can feel their concentration. Their, it's like that. It's the same thing with art when, when, or music. When the kids are really deeply in, engaged, maybe, maybe it's not necessarily what they're physically doing, you, but you can tell that they are really working. And uh, that's just, you know, that just makes supervisors crazy. They're like, well, what are they doing? What is the objective? Where's, where's the proof? And I'm just like, well, I can tell. And I, I, I love the art my kids are making, but my process is not, you know, I, I'm trying to have a studio. And I want to please my supervisor, but a real art experience is a studio. Yes, yes that's true. And it's it's a hard culture to to um, to to get working in your classroom. And once you do, it's hard. You don't want to break that down for. Well, I appreciate all this um, help because it is helping me to explain it because I don't have the words. Um, I'd rather be making the art. So it's <laughs> helping me explain it. And you know what? This year with this with this assistant principal, God bless him. He has come in and he's been doing the work with his kids. I was just okay. going to give, give him the paintbrush, give him give him the materials, and say, "Do it with us and see what." And, you know, and I have to say, his drawing has improved dramatically. There we go. Well, so let me. This might be a good way to kind of take that and tie it together. The the webinar. Back when I first came to Connecticut, shortly after I arrived, uh, then Commissioner of Education Jerry Tarasi who had studied out in, at Stanford with Elliot Eisner uh, after he, I think, while he was a, a superintendent of schools in New Haven, came back and he said, all right, Scott, let's have summer seminars where we invite school superintendents 
to participate and let's ex let's have them work with the finest people in the arts so they really understand what the arts are about because so many of these folks just don't really understand they've never been involved in the arts so we got Elliot Eisner as the main thread for the week and of course he was brilliant and then we uh, they danced with Palabolus Wow. They they went to they talked with Lloyd Richards the playwright. They um, they just had this amazing series of arts experiences. And one of the projects that Elliot had them do was to cut out to avoid the technical barriers. Had them cut out some images, one image that they liked from a magazine, and then he gave them a little template like it was an index card. It had to be that big and they had to cut it out. Then they had to write a poem about it. And these superintendents, you have never seen such concentration in your life because they knew that there was going to be an exhibit in front of their peers at the end, right after lunch. After lunch, everybody's going to come back and see what everybody else had done. And it was like the air was crackling with concentration. Um, and they were really a little nervous about what the, <laughs> we we tried not to layer on too much of that because they were they were already freaked to start out with. But I, that kind of experience that you're saying and, and kudos to your principal or your supervisor for for participating like that is going to give some insights that you really couldn't talk through. They just have to kind of experience it themselves to get it. It would be well, very cool if he, if he exhibited with your students on uh, whatever night it is that you put up yeah, your stuff. Great idea, actually. I should have hung up his drawings. Um, he's very cool. Well, I, I'm, I'm just grateful I still have a job. There are some people in Pennsylvania without one now. Uh -huh. So can hang on. Well, the, arts are, the arts are going to help heal the community if we can keep it growing. Amen to that. Yeah. Well, well thank, you thank you for thank you for participating, everybody. And uh, Thanks, everybody. And uh, next week we have a visual art on Steam uh, presentation, and I think the week after that we have one on uh, elementary music. So keep looking at your email for email blasts and information. Thanks again, Scott. I appreciate Thanks, it. Scott. Thank you. My pleasure. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.